All right, thank you, everybody. Um, it looks like we have enough pink sheets so we can take questions and answers for about half an hour. So um, we'll start the, the public comment section about 7, 705 so that we can still get out of here by, by 730. That should give everybody enough time to, to get through their full statements. Um, so right now we're going to do questions. You did not need to submit a pink sheet. We are going to ask that you come up to the podium. Again, we are recording this to be posted online. And so that way we can make sure to, to get everybody's questions so that everybody can review that as well. So does anybody have questions to start with for our panel? Please make sure to state your name and who you're here representing. My name is Carmel Kale. I'm from Pondale, and I'm representing myself. Thank you, Carmel. Um, we heard Mr. Spencer talking about um, the importance of the RMP and how it lasts uh, for 22 years in the case of the Rock Springs RMP, and that decisions are made based on what is in the RMP. And I'm wondering about the flexibility of RMPs and in particular the Green River Resource Management Plan, which is the Rock Springs RMP's predecessor, um, as relates to migration quarters, since that's, that's what we're here about tonight. And I noticed in the Green River RMP um, several areas, and I'll just read you one of them because uh, the verbiage is fairly repeated in other areas. Um, and where it talks about uh, we're in the leasable mineral sections, what is open and pretty much everything is open unless something else. Where maximum protection of resources is necessary, a no surface occupancy requirement will be imposed. Areas identified as needing maximum protection are shown on table seven and map 14. And there are quite a few areas, not as many as for example, land or RP. However, additional areas may be identified through site-specific environmental analysis and activity planning. And to me, this means that additional areas for no surface occupancy may be identified through site-specific environmental analysis, which might involve migration quarters that were not defined 22 years ago, or activity planning. And so I'm hoping that someone, probably to put Mr. Spencer in the heat seat, um, can address what flexibility this might allow the BLM. Well, we are in the process of reviewing the language from the Rollins, Pinedale, and Rock Springs Green River Resource Management Plans to determine how we could effectively deal with any migration corridor stipulation. And I forgot to say when I was speaking there is that none of these plans currently have any stipulations that apply specifically to the migration corridors. Part of that generally the thinking has has evolved there that when it comes to no surface occupancy that is typically a resource management level resource management planning level decision since it is a a major constraint it has to be reviewed typically through an environmental impact statement as you know the rollins or rock springs resource management plan is currently being revised and it is uh, addressing migration corridors when it is finally released for public comment. Game and Fish has been an active cooperating agency on that, as have been a number of other parties. But part of that is, is that you cannot have really a lease issued and then come in later and say, now it's all no certain occupancy. So you've got to balance that. That just does not work unless you're going to go through the environmental impact statement, you're going to get to it. And I suppose you could come up to a situation where you might have a no surface occupancy applied to an entire lease, which then launch into a whole nother uh, debate on how you're going to deal with that valid existing right and trying to find them reasonable use of their lease. So there's a little flexibility, but it's it's not so much that typically I'm going to say you can't come in and create stipulations unless the resource management plan is pretty clear on the areas it's going to cover and a, a few more specifics on. But we are in the process, like I said, to repeat myself, we are looking at Rollins and Pinedale with their existing language to see, is there any flexibility in there on how they dealt with corridors and and what sort of stipulation could be envisioned that way? And the Rock Springs is under its own revision right now. Can I do a quick follow up? Yes, ma'am. 
So to be a little more pointed about it. Okay. <laughs> it did say additional areas may be identified through site-specific environmental analysis. And I assume that that is an analysis which would then be an additional area identified for no surface occupancy. I totally get it about not after the fact. Yeah. There are leases coming up on February 25th, of which I am very afraid. Is there any flexibility with this sentence to do something for those leases before they are issued? And they are being offered, just they are, they were on the map there yes. that were being and offered. Been, yeah. So we, we've looked at through the environmental assessment and we've determined that we can lease them with that lease notice and we'll have acceptable impacts we did not determine in coordination with, with Game and Fish that we needed no surface occupancy on those leases, on those parcels to be offered. But is there any flexibility? Well, if the environmental analysis doesn't support that you need a no surface occupancy, you just can't create one and put it on it. If the analysis shows that the lease notice takes care of it, we proceed forward. That's how it'll work sequentially through the analysis. If you don't show impacts that the stipulation will not effectively deal with, you can't move to the next level of restriction. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Kent Conway, Lincoln County Commissioner, also Chairman of the Coalition of Local Governments for the entire Southwestern Wyoming. My main question, I'm not sure who's going to answer it, because when 3362 came out, we found out about it through phone calls locally. We were never a seat at the table, so my key question is this. How do you do a process like this and not have your local officials there? We are cooperators on the Rock Springs plan. We're there all the time, and every commissioner in the Southwest did not know anything about 362 and the implementation of it. The NGOs had a seat at the table. We are the elected officials that are cooperating agencies. We were not a part of this process. That will have a great amount of heartburn in my colleagues, I'm gonna tell you right now. So why weren't we involved? Why do we have to get literally back door to know that 3362 is coming down through the pike? And you're, we're the agencies, we are the group that you're going to be asking all of you agencies to sell this walk up in front of the public and say this is a good thing for these reasons with zero input why weren't we involved thank you sure brad let's go <laughs> i i would have to say there that i guess i can't speak for brad but i'm gonna assume he got the same email i did that was distributed on a public news release announcing the secretarial order uh clearly the secretary doesn't coordinate with at our level to say, hey, I'm issuing the secretarial order tomorrow. So there hasn't really been any public coordination on the issuance of it. As far as generally how we're gonna work together is through the resource management planning process that I talked about when it comes up with stipulations, how we work through that. That's where the rubber meets the road for us there. And that's where we'll have our cooperating agencies involved there to help look at the stipulations. As far as like designating corridors, I'd have to let Angie and the Game and Fish speak to that. I'd say that we're working on making a better effort to make sure that that is um, that the local communities are involved in that. And so this next steps that are being taken, there'll be meetings in Aetna, um, Cameron and Green River. And so we're hoping that, you know, some of those local constituents can be engaged in those. And a lot of it comes down to um, our field managers when 3362 came out, it kind of hit us too. We didn't know it was coming, um, but we're making efforts and we're learning as we go. Um, you know, we've been uh, designating crucial habitats since the 1980s, and when we started, we, we mainly worked with a lot of those key stakeholders that were really affected by the, the decision, the land use decisions, the landowners, and, and we're kind of learning as we go now that there's a lot more, um, even through computer and social media, the people are a little more informed that this stuff's going on, and so we've basically taken a step back from, since we did sublet yield there, and we're really trying to make an extra concerted effort with our local managers to reach out to the local county governments and, and key stakeholders in those communities so they, they have an opportunity to know what's going on and provide us feedback. And I, I don't have an excuse for what's going on up until this point, but from here on out, we're gonna do, we're gonna make a concerted effort and we've got a lot of our guys here tonight that are planning local meetings in, in some of your communities that hopefully folks can get involved. Yeah, if you would. 
specifically to part of what you just said. Every county I speak for has its own land use policy. That land use policy hasn't been taken into this scenario. And we're very specific. We spend a lot of money, time, manpower, and public input to create those plans. And those plans are preeminent in how you, this whole system functions. They're recognized in your process. And for us to have a consistency policy review out of the governor of the state of Wyoming, they have to look alike. And if we don't have a seat at the table, that can't happen. Okay. I'm Dave Hole from Pinedale, uh, here as a citizen. Um, I, it's my impression that the 90-10 process or is a uh, kind of a, a loose process that hasn't been really very specifically uh, analyzed in its uh, creation. And um, one, of the, one of the questions I have about its implementation involves uh, what really is it that influences or interferes with a mule deer? Is it the existence of a, an object or is it the disturbance that come, is created by that? And where this might come into play is if you have a, a well pad right on the edge of the corridor that's active, the disturbance from that, as I understand from the research, is uh, extends up to a kilometer. <coughs> so that would then, that disturbance would then extend approximately a kilometer inside of the corridor. And if that's then taken into account, that pad would want to be moved approximately a quarter of, or a, a kilometer away from the, uh, away from the, the uh, corridor. So is there clarification on that point? Uh, so, Dave, I will take a step at that, and maybe Doug can follow up, or Matt as well. But um, the, I believe the study you're referring to is by Paul Sawyer and others in, um, over in the Pinedale Amapine area. Yeah, so that's um, one that we have asked um, him to go back and reanalyzing it, because those effects were specific for winter concentration areas, winter mm -hmm. habitat. And part of that area of the study that was interesting because it does overlap with the migration corridor, at least part of it. Um, however, that's not what he was evaluating. Um, those are two different seasonal okay. habitats. So that's what we've asked him to go back and right. see if he can reanalyze to, to come out with some sort of threshold um, or some disturbance threshold that we can base future recommendations on. Right. And I yep. was aware that, that that additional study was being done. But I think this also illustrates at least one way in which the 90-10 is perhaps a little loose at this point. And it also then illustrates why it would be appropriate to wait till we have definite knowledge of how that works with actual stipulations in place before we move forward. And I guess I would ask that uh, leasing be suspended, but uh, that's a different issue. Thank you, David. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Esther Wagner, Vice President of Public Lands with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. And I have um, probably about three questions. Hope that's okay. Um, Esther, can you hold on just one moment? We did have some complaints that people couldn't hear you. Oh, so I will have you. Just mm -hmm. one second. This lady's going to talk to us for just a minute. And then when she shuts up, we'll begin to go. Power on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. Okay, great. Thanks. So, uh, no problem. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Much better. Um, so my first question actually is, um, 
talking about the criteria that define a corridor, and I guess this would probably be a question maybe for Doug. Um, the sublet mule deer corridor, you know, it definitely looks like a highway, but the bags corridor looks more like a wildlife or transitional range. I would like to know, um, can you explain the difference and why they're both considered corridors? And just as a little follow-up to that, um, Angie, you were talking about the 90-10 um, that you're using to uh, uh, make recommendations for deferrals. And I want to know how that works with the BACS corridor. Portions of it are, I don't know, five miles wide. Um, so there, there's a couple of questions there. Yeah, I'd like, I guess with the corridor, um, so a, a good example, I guess, would be the BACS compared to sub, like you said. And so those corridors are based on the same methodology and, and those animals that are using that landscape are just using it a little bit differently. And so BAGS is a little bit broader and, and it may not be as, um, you know, it's not as funneled as it is on the sublet herd, but it's based on the same methodology that we use to designate based on multiple animals using those, those same areas. It just happened to be very similar um, sample size of deer and very, very similar um, um, migration sequences or number of times those animals we used it. It's just that they were um, a little more spread out on that terrain in the bags area. And um, I guess I don't have a, a, any uh, anything additional to add unless Andy you have something. Well, Esther raises a good point. So um, the strategy, like I talked about, was with the idea that directional or horizontal drilling may still be able to extract mineral from underneath the corridors and with bags being so wide um you know i i guess i heard a rumor a few weeks ago that they could horizontal drill three miles but i don't think they're up to five or six or ten yet so you're exactly right that that um is different um both corridors are you know drastically different in size that way um, we currently are applying the same strategy um and we're evaluating that and figuring out what we would do differently with bags and maybe with other ones as well um and i think that's where more of a stipulation comes into play and what we'll see in the future as we learn more about like um doug said the how the um yield deer are acting in that area and what protections are needed um and then just uh just as a follow-up, uh, do you know how long you're going to um, be recommending deferrals? I mean, is there an end game here for when that's going to stop? I'll answer that if you're looking at me. Um, yeah, so um, in our recommendations to the BLM, we say two things. We say we want it deferred until a uh, stipulation can be put in place. As you heard Dwayne talk about the amendments to the RMP that are needed for those stipulations to be created. Um, or that if that lease parcel can be reconfigured to um, allow for more space outside the corridor. So if um, maybe they were deferred in one sale, but the next sale, the lease parcel could come up for sale and be amended in its shape or size to allow for more space for it to meet the criteria. Um, and just to go along with that, I'm just wondering uh, why are deferral recommendations, why were they made for parcels that were located in sage grouse core areas um, where there are already rigorous protections in place, such as the one well pad for 640 and the 5% disturbance cap? Um, so the sage grouse stipulations that are currently in place, just like Esther said, do have a disturbance threshold and a density threshold as well, one for 640. Um, until we have the science behind that telling us that's enough, we're going to do more for migration corridors. And even though we are working very closely with proponents in sage grouse core to minimize and avoid impacts to those that species, we feel that the special lease notice that is put on these parcels allows us to open the door in that conversation for migration corridors. If we're only talking about sage grouse, our folks in the field can't talk about migration corridors as well, unless we put that special lease notice on there. Okay, thank you. Questions? Commissioner Real quick. Mark Anselmi, I'm here representing myself, resident of Rock Springs. You have the goal of a special lease notice. I understand the goal. How is that special lease notice? How are they going to be enforced? Like, I understand if you go down there and you see, you can put a 
building pad over here then and but what if the operator says no we won't do that how do you how do you enforce a special lease notice okay so <laughs> the lease notice will be enforced as part of the application for permit to drill process and essentially what it's saying is it's a buyer beware we've identified this area we don't have a stipulation you're entirely correct it's not the same a stipulation modifies the term in the lease and says we can do the following the lease notice is more of all it's called the buyer beware is we have this area out there that we're going to have to work on with the game and fish we've got as angie said we went over the memorandum of understanding that we have on how we coordinate on issues and so we will work with the operator to come up with a plan to try and address the issues that are identified in our coordination with game and fish we'll go through the approval process which involves pre preparation of environmental assessment we'll identify appropriate mitigation and and it could say the oil and gas operator could say no i'm not going to do that they could appeal that and that goes up through an appeal process typically could probably be sent back to the field office and say well i guess it's unclear go ahead and let's prepare an environmental impact statement because if it's that significant we walk, walk to the next level after that comes out we'll have a decision if an environmental impact statement gets done that says here's the impacts here's what needs to be done or or not done and another decision comes out of which the, the oil and gas operator has another appeal period or another appeal process and depending what comes out if they went through an appeal and they said nope you didn't justify it none of them could be applied and then they could be taken off or yes you've got the rationale to justify the mitigation measures that that you come up with i have to say generally in wyoming we have very good agreement with oil and gas proponents there on mitigating wildlife related issues i mean because they know for blm perspective is we've got an agreement with the state we've got an mou we're going to coordinate back and forth and typically if the game and fish is going to say no it's the rare operator who's going to forge forward and say i don't care what they say i still want to do it this other way we've we've uh honestly it's rare that we ever have a disagreement between our field biologists at blm and the game and fish they've come out they've done the on siting they've come up with what they think is a pretty good mitigation plan we angie and i've met on this many times and we've not come really up with situations where we've been where we say absolutely yes or no and we've had a major disagreement out we've been able to work together to resolve it it's not as good as a stipulation we'll acknowledge that and our goal one thing i didn't answer earlier here is that our state director mary joe rugwell has made it really clear to to like brad and i and we met with the game and fish folks the other day that she wants us to find a, a solution on how we want to move forward she's given us some pretty clear tasks to look at what we have available in rollins and pinedale can we do something there easy or is it going to be hard rock springs is a separate it's already under a revision there's a process already set in place there and so she's asked us to get together and work on it some more and come up with because the stipulation is the ultimate goal and just so everybody understands I, I i can't speak for game and fish but we've not been approaching this this is not a permanent never lease it it is going to have a stipulation on it at some level and be available for leasing that's the approach we've all taken thank you Mr. spencer as long as I have the podium, when do you think that the Paul Sawyer's study is going to be done? I should know that, but I, I didn't I didn't know how much it costs, but I never heard really when it was going to yeah, be done. Yeah, we're we're um, anticipating that you'll have something by the middle of summer, so by July we should have some kind of sense of where we're going to be at with that that research. So we have that research, and we're going to use it. Then we'll yes, that, that is our intent. That's is to apply good. that to our you know recommendations and what we know about migrations in the middle of summer February. thank you mr crowder i'm not gonna let you off uh there's some you talk about the state lands and i'm a state land leasee and i understand that uh, your charge is to maximize the income for the schools and the various trusts and the state hospital and the university do you take into account the value of the deer and the uh, the other migrating species, or uh, if you don't, I think you should look at that. And I mean, you've got a lease for $64. You know, that's the price of a deer license. And I don't know what, you know, I don't, I'd like to think that my grandkids will have more than $64 enjoyment out of those deer. So I hope you keep that in mind. Thank you. 
We have about five more minutes for questions. You still have your question? I'll do it. All right, come on up. My name is Richard Kale. I'm over at Pondale. And, uh, I represent the deer over there and so I heard. And I got a couple of different things I'd like to ask. One of which is you mention all the time that will bore in these in these these leases. What what do, what do you take excuse me, Miss? What what do you how do you take into account the infrastructure? If you if you go to the Say the Jonah Field, those things, the well pads themselves were were minimal. What happens when when you permit a well and they abide by and they put it outside the corridor? How do you get a road to it? Uh, is that have you taken that into account? How do they? What is there stipulations that they can't develop inside or they can't have infrastructure in that corridor because they got it? They got a hog drilling right here. From someplace, and that's up to the NRS that's going to work on that. And they got the they got the fluid that they've got to come in with the well. They've got they've got fluid to export from that well. How does how do you take that into account? My contention is that if you and a Sawyer, I think in his studies before, which is which was some time back, but he had he he determined what roads and traffic had to do with, and that wasn't migration as I understand it, but, and we're, we're considered really, and we're, we're really concerned with these stopover areas. And my thing is, you, you build a road across there and you have trucks back and forth, back and forth across that corridor. What, what important, if you're going to sever the, the corridor itself, what, why are your stopover areas there any longer of any importance if the deer can't get there? What have you done with the with the access, the infrastructure that will be associated with these wells? Angie, okay, I'll jump in. Um, there was a lot of questions there, sir. I'll see if I how I do. Um, so, when I say development infrastructure, yes, our mind usually goes to well pads, but that's taken all of those into account. So roads, compressor stations, whatever it may be is part of that development infrastructure. So our goal is to locate that outside the corridor. That's all the infrastructure and not just the well pad. Um, but you brought up another fa um, interesting point, which is the activity, um, such as just the amount of um, traffic that is taking place. Um, and so that too is going to be part of that on-site analysis where we're looking at minimizing um, and avoiding the impacts to the mule deer or whatever um, big game species. And that might include things like travel management plans to really evaluate how those um, activities can be reduced to a minimal amount. Um, but it's all encompassing. And so if I was brief by saying a well pad, I'm really meaning all the infrastructure and the activity associated with it that we would look to minimize and avoid impacts. Okay, Bill Emmer over here. You gonna you gonna outlaw any kind of a road across this? The, I mean, I was at NRS at one time for the BLM, and I mean things have changed an awful lot. If, if the, they're in a lot of stroke with an NRS, let me tell you, out on the ground. I, I mean, when that when you know, and we leave a little area out here outside the corridor that we can put a well pad, and that's fine. But you got a wetland out there, which you can't you can't put a whip the pad on a wetland. You got an arc site that you can't. When that operator says, I don't have a stipulation, I'm gonna drill this well right over here. And that's where it'll be drilled, sir. Unless things have changed because of whatever her name is, the new lady upstairs. But are you gonna allow a road across, or am I as an NRS, a BLM rep out on the ground, am I gonna say? I can't build a road across the corridor. Do I have the stroke to do that? Well, I, I think we have to back up a little bit. And I'll go back to what I said earlier here is that we've had no discussions that we're treating these areas as no surface occupancy. We've been working together to try and develop what, what will a reasonable stipulation look like? What do we need to mitigate there? 
and that's what the discussion will be. Because if you if you take these areas as no surface occupancy, that's an entire different level of discussion on it. It's, it sounds like you're an NRS, you are you are well aware on it, and definitely we would be launching into an environmental impact statement to analyze all the impacts that that no surface occupancy going to be is going to cause, as well as the positive things it's going to cause for other resources there. So we've not been approaching this as a no surface occupancy. If it was no surface occupancy, we generally wouldn't proceed forward with any leasing activity or anything like that. So, well, you're going to let me build a road across the across the across the corridor. Then. I mean, generally, you know. If all things being equal is all we had was the corridor there and not a single other resource issued in the on the on the ground, we've not been managing it as a no surface occupancy. And there are thousands of roads already across it already there. So not treated this area as a no surface occupancy. And that's a really key thing for us there is we're not in that position yet to treat it that way. Fine. Thank you. You know, but there could be restrictions, as Angie said. There'd be travel management, there could be timing that says, hey, this time of year you gotta go across between Eight and eight thirty, and that's it. Once a day. I mean, there are a variety of. Even though you have a road there, there can still be travel management. There could be timing restrictions on what time you do the activities. Could be all of them performed outside of the time of year when the migration is occurring. That say you got to get it done in August and September, and have all of that done there, and then you're just in pure operational mode. So, wouldn't that really be a stip then, sir? It part of it will be a stipulation. Yes. I mean, when it comes to other surface uses like right-of-ways, et cetera, they're not called stipulations in terms and conditions. I know it's a lot of BLMEs to go into. And since you're an NRS, you got it all nailed on it there. But that's the thing is, is that stipulations are only an oil and gas term there. As far as other surface disturbing use restrictions there, that's a different discussion to have there. They're not stipulations, but it still could be identified as surface disturbing restrictions. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. I'm sure Dwayne would like to talk later if needed. Sure. Time for one final question. Who's it going to be? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Lamb from the Nature Conservancy, and I just want to um, give my appreciation to all of you for being willing to put all this information out in front of us. It's really helpful. Thanks to Game of Fish. Um, I'm going to pick on Angie and Doug one more time. Can you give an explanation for the 90% deferral threshold? Definitely. Um, so with BLM um, lease parcels, they come in a variety of sizes. So that they could be um, a common one to wrap our head around is just a square mile, 640 acres. But I believe they can be four times that big maximum Dwayne yep. um, and they can be smaller as well so what if we have a 40 acre parcel does 10 percent to put the infrastructure on enough probably not that's only four acres so again the 90 percent is a first filter it's a way of reviewing the parcels to see if we feel there's adequate space if there is a smaller parcel we'll take a harder look at that if there's limitations on that space we take a lot harder look at that as well it's a place to start, and it's kind of that first step to make sure we have adequate space outside the corridor. So it's it's not so hard and fast as maybe um, you, you might have thought. There's more that goes into it than just 90 or greater or lower. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Can I follow up on that? Can you give us what your criteria is, that, that stuff that makes it not so tight rule? Are you going to get come up with guidelines that give somebody the, to know that? How do you know that yeah. to internally with you? Yeah, so um, I could go into that more in depth with anyone. I kept the presentation today kind of light because I knew that was kind of heavy going through all those steps anyway. Um, but again, we're making sure there's adequate space outside the corridor. Um, all right, great questions, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm sure the panelists would enjoy standing, staying after 7.30 to have a little bit more conversations for those of you that are interested in more in-depth information. But right now, let's move on to the public comment period. We have six people who have asked to speak. So I will go ahead and start that with Brett. Brett. All right. Brett is up first. You sound like you're a loud speaker, so. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can speak pretty loud. All right. Um, 
Hello, my name is Brett Gervinanti. I'm a, a resident here in Casper. Um, I, I didn't realize that I could just probably get up here and just have a question. So, uh, but I, I did have, did write some things down. You know, um, I apologize. You know, if, if I'm uh, perhaps a little bit naive, some of these facts. You know, there's so many of them. It could be really dense. Um, but I stand before you. I'm a Wyoming citizen. Uh, I just wanted uh, to speak against uh, in, in opposition of leasing parcels uh, within uh, the migration corridors. We have a, a huge resource with with our, our mule deer population, of course. Um, wanted to, to uh, make sure to, to focus on some of the, 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 the what we say is the science uh, behind um, these migrations. I just wanted to call uh, attention to the fact that the science is really just a, a, a view on what we think is going on out there. And, 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 and the multiplicity of those, of those studies when they come through and they, we have multiple studies, and we can have a pretty good idea that yes, this is the way that things are out there. But it's, it still is a, kind of a, a, an idea about what we think of, of, of uh, in reality. Reality is very complicated. There's a lot of factors that are going on. So I'm, I'm just throwing that out there that maybe the things that are present in those studies perhaps are not everything that is that is being affected. And I, I, I like some of the other comments about um, do we know what disturbance is? How far does that go? And does this really impact the, those those uh, uh, those migration corridors and, and, and those animals? I also want to bring bring attention to. Um, uh, Wyoming Gaming Fish, uh, your charge is to is to uh, protect wildlife, and, uh, and I want to see that balance kind of uh, kind of working more in favor of protecting wildlife. Um, it's 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 a tough game, and you know you know you at BLM are kind of the same way. You've got the multiple use thing going on. You've got to do this little juggling act. Um, but where is it, and when is it that that, that we are are going to try to um, weight the scale a little bit more to the, to the natural world. Um, I just wanted to, to close here, not to take too much time. Um, you know, some of these areas. You know, we have we have some of the the largest like roadless areas uh, in the lower 48 here in Wyoming. This is this is it. So so we this is a very important resource. And and you know when it's gone, it's out. It's not. You know, we, if, we, if we if we develop in those areas. It's uh, it's over with. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Uh, you know, I wanted to just in closing here, just just to make mention that Wyoming Game and Fish um, has a, a really big impact on what 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 BLM does and, and, and some of those, uh, uh, st those those ideas that come through on that uh, resource management plans as they come out. And that uh, you and, and, and uh, of course, in, in concert with the with the governor's office. You know, have a have a have a big impact on on uh, on how our lands are and, and wildlife and, and areas are, are managed in the state. And I just would hope that uh, that everyone would stay strong and, and make those commitments to uh, to the natural world to, to make sure it stays protected. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Well, that was two minutes and fifty three seconds. That was pretty incredible. So, <laughs> thank you for keeping <laughs> under three. Much appreciated. So um, next we have Esther. Esther, would you like to speak, please? Well, Esther comes up just as a reminder, as you hear things tonight and if you choose to formulate a comment that you want to get to us, my email is on the back. If you provide that to me here in the next few days, I'll make sure to get it to all the panelists. Esther. Okay, great. Um, I'll just introduce myself again. I'm Esther Wagner, Vice President, Public Lands with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. And I'm here representing the thousands of employees currently working in Wyoming who are directly employed by the oil and gas industry, as well as the independent operators and companies that produce 90% of natural gas and 80% of the crude oil in the state. PAW understands the importance of wildlife to the state and agrees that protection of migration functionality is important. We also appreciate the Game and Fish Department's efforts to increase its outreach to stakeholders on this matter. We support the process in Action 4 that Doug spoke about of the Game and Fish Ungulate Migration Corridor Strategy, which outlines a case-by-case -case approach to providing recommendations on surface projects and land use planning. This process 
was developed through stakeholder engagement about three years ago, and we were assured on several occasions at that time that there was no intent to develop blanket restrictions on migration corridors. We also support the requirement in BLM's special lease notice requiring operators when planning activities in corridors to consult with the BLM and the Game and Fish to avoid and minimize impacts in order to maintain migration corridor functionality. This is similar to the Office of State Lands um, migration corridor lease stipulation as well. As far as we know, this case-by-case -case approach as outlined in the Game and Fish migration corridor strategy, the BLM special lease notice and the Office of State Lands lease stipulation has not failed. BW does not support blanket NSO stipulations in corridors, nor do we support the use of standard stipulations, unreasonable pad and density limitations, or the deferral of lease parcels located in corridors that would potentially put millions of acres off limits for development in the state. It's important to take into consideration that with each new restriction and regulatory burden put in place, lands become less prospective. Wyoming competes economically with um, plays all over the globe for investment dollars. The ongoing deferral recommendations by the Game of Fish will remove lands that overlie valuable mineral resources that may have significant economic consequences. We're fortunate to live and work in Wyoming where we have world-class resources, whether they are oil and gas deposits or wildlife. We understand the need to conserve, but we also recognize the need to be able to continue to do business. We've been producing oil and gas in the state for over 130 years and continue to enjoy clean air, clean water, and abundant wildlife. PAW wants to protect the functionality of migration corridors, but we want to make sure that it's based on good science and the recognition of the protections already in place. We believe that the current case-by-case -case basis approach to development as outlined in the Game and Fish uh, Migration Corridor Strategy, the BLM Special Lease Notice, and the Office of State Lands Lease Stipulation provide the necessary protection for migration corridor functionality. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Esther. All right, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I'll aim to be pretty brief in my comments. Um, first of all, I want to express, um, I'm Kristen Gunther from the Wyoming Outdoor Council, just caught that. Um, I want to express my gratitude, first of all, to everyone, again, who's come out and spent time. Um, we think it's really important um, to bring the public together to answer questions, and we really appreciate your willingness to come out um, and stand for questions from folks on this pretty important topic. Um, and just for a little bit of context, um, for those of you who might not have heard us present at past commission meetings, we do approach this question as an organization that has expressed a number of concerns associated with the special leaks notice language. So that's kind of the, the context. Um, but I just want to make a couple of comments from kind of a 30,000 foot level. Um, first, I, I think that the reason why the Outdoor Council and then lots of citizens, I get emails about especially mule deer migration on a pretty regular basis, have been so concerned is just the size and the scope of the lease sales that we're talking about right now, um, that throughout 2018, um, we saw over a million acres um, that were put up for oil and gas lease. And that's on top of the over 8 million acres um, that's already leased out um, for oil and gas production in the state. So we're talking at a pretty large scale if you think about the quarterly sales coming up this year, as well as the special February sale, that's the delayed sale um, from the fourth quarter last year, that's five lease sales happening this week. So from our perspective, um, that's a lot of acres that we're talking about, and it's happening really quickly. And it makes all of these questions feel pretty pressing and pretty urgent. Um, and I guess mostly what I wanted to offer is that we just hope that the Game and Fish feels empowered to ask for everything that you need um, and to act as cautiously as you possibly can in this climate where these huge lease sales um, are happening and, and this is happening at such a rapid pace. And just to narrow in on mule deer for a second, which we know are kind of anomalous or their own special case, even among migratory ungulates, um, I guess we're, we're really encouraged and excited to hear um, that there is this new research coming out from Dr. Hall Sawyer. Um, we'll be glad to see how that's applied in corridors. And I guess I would, I would just offer respectfully that if that new figure, that new threshold is coming, it might be worth a second consideration 
um, about perhaps asking the BLM to press pause just in these really narrow areas that are critical for, for mule deer, uh, which don't actually represent a huge percentage of these large lease sales. Um, and the last couple of them anywhere from between like five and nine percent of these sales. So they're relatively narrow areas that we're talking about. So if we know that that research is in the pipeline, pun intended, um, then perhaps it does make sense to hit pause just briefly while we figure this out. Um, because um, I would echo the comments from my predecessor, it's important that we use um, good science to make decisions about where and how to lease in these areas. And finally, I just wanted to compliment for a moment, um, in Ms. Bruce's presentation, it was really useful to be able to see these specific parcels and see how these decisions are getting made. Um, and so, you know, given the level of attendance we've seen at this meeting tonight, um, the level of attendance we think we'll probably see at these meetings around the state, um, as much as we can invite um, or make transparent that case-by-case -case process for the public, um, we think that would be really useful for people to see. I also just, one last note, um, wanted to call back a quote by Dr. Kaufman in his presentation about how bighorn sheep present a cautionary tale about maintaining the migration routes that we have today. Um, and I just, I sure hope that we're being cautious enough about how we manage for these migrations. With that, um, thank you again for gathering everyone tonight. Thank you, Kristen. Oh. Yeah, it's just you. Uh, evening, I will make my uh, comments brief. I'm Paul Ulrich, Director of Jonah Energy. We operate the Jonah Field in Southwest Wyoming. That, uh, I also happen to live in Pinedale, so as you've noticed, the whole town's here. If everybody wants to rob a bank in the morning, Pinedale's the place to do it, I guarantee you that. Um, we're all here. Um, it, and I want to first say that from a Pinedale standpoint, as a resident, as an operator that has a very significant stake in Wyoming, what I've seen in the past couple of years in your process and our process on the ground shows me promise. Uh, I'm seeing uh, sportsmen work with operators, work with the game and fish on actual on the ground habitat improvement projects, fence removal, fence modification, and a lot of other projects. And I really think that's where a lot of the focus should be. Um, uh, discussion tonight has certainly been focused on deferral of leases. Um, uh, Dwayne, I do appreciate your comment on that, and I know it's been looked at, so I'm not going to address that. But what I am going to talk about uh, is, is all of you ensuring that you have all the information you need from an operator standpoint who's been doing this a long time on the ground on our ability today to avoid, minimize, and work with local communities, local folks that are invested in this issue is to make sure we get it right. And I don't want that lost in a larger, bigger statewide picture. I really want you to focus on working with those of us that are doing it on the ground locally and the lessons that, uh, that, that we can learn and that we can teach. And I think that's critical. Um, I also want to hit on reclamation. Uh, and, and the reason I want to do this is the technology in the advancements we've made over the last several years on reclamation in the hearts of some of this habitat uh, it is, is enviable uh, to other states and other areas where reclamation has proven to be much more difficult. And I can guarantee you, uh, trying to regrow sage grouse in the middle of the Jonah field has not been easy. We have done it and we have seen evidence, clear evidence, uh, quantifiable scientific backed evidence that we can make habitat better over a, 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 an amount of time. And I think that's important for us to consider in all of this. Whether you believe it or not, come out to the Jonah Field and I'll show you. But we can make habitat better after uh, we reduce our initial impact. And, and I think that's key when we talk about this. I want to talk real briefly about science. Um, what I'm hearing tonight are two things. One, some of our science is outdated, but we've got some coming. Two, it's purely mule deer based. I, I, I have some real hesitation with that. When I take a look at a draft pronghorn migration corridor that cuts down, and if you're not familiar with Pinedale and Sublette County, cuts down the spine of the sixth largest natural gas field in the country, uh, and then dumps into the eighth largest natural gas field in the country. I'm questioning why we're talking about a draft corridor and a migration corridor for pronghorn in two of the intensely developed fields in the country. So at some point, I'd love an answer for why we're addressing that particular issue uh, when, they're, when they're traveling 
right down the densest development in the state of Wyoming. I'm real curious about where that's headed, but I'll close with this. I've probably gone over my three minutes. Um, I'm dedicated to following the science. I know all of you are too. I'm not convinced we're quite there yet, and I, and I certainly believe that's the reason for the request for deferrals. I encourage all of us to get to work and figure out what those proper and, and meaningful and measured thresholds are. We know we need them for court. Uh, we know we need them for, for meal deer. We know the impacts can be significant and we need to be looking at on the ground projects to mitigate those impacts and developing better science so we can apply reasonable, meaningful thresholds. Uh, that's critical and I think that's where the real work needs to begin uh, sooner than later. So follow the science. Uh, it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine? It's a hard act to follow, Paul. What are you having the meeting in Pinedale? Um, I'll put that up here in just a minute. Two shows in the police sale. And yes, uh, half of Pinedale is here tonight. We made it. And we appreciate you being here and being invited to have open comments and so forth. I think my, I'm Elaine Crumpley, and I'm here. Uh, Representing a uh, nonprofit group that has been around for a while in Pinedale and Sublette County called Citizens United for Responsible Energy Development. And it means exactly that responsible energy development. And that's what we strive for in this area. I'm here particularly to speak about our Sublette County mule deer. I appreciate all of the ungulates that are migrating, but I'm going to speak mostly about the uh, Sublette County herd. I want to tell you right now, in the past 20 years, <clears throat> the Sublette County herd it started out at 32,011, supposedly. It is now, as of last year, well, seven, 2017 and 18, it's down to 17,299. That's a 46% decrease in our Sublet County mule deer herd. On the anticline, we have a 71% decrease. These are facts. These are for real. So, so this is what I'm speaking about. I'm standing for them. I also want to say that when I went to school to become a biologist, my, what I learned was that what Wyoming Game and Fish was portrayed in our textbooks was world-class management. That's why I moved here. It was considered the epitome of the best management. And I hope you continue that, that continuum. I want you to do that. I want to be proud that we are part of that. And um, Angie, in speaking of your presentation of the Game and Fish recommendations, for oil and gas leasing, and also paying close attention to Dr. Kaufman's Science of Migration, and of course reading that wonderful book, thoroughly, actually, I did. It seems that to me there is only one simple possible solution for this right now, and that's to suspend, not defer, because that's kicking the can down the highway, but suspend until we have an RMP that is finished, that has stipulations, that have teeth in it, that will allow our wildlife to continue on that migration corridor. I'm talking about the, uh, you know, the Red Desert to the Hoback migration, migration corridor. So um, I'm concerned how much more can that herd take in regards to a, a stress point? How much more can they do before it's gone? And you know, we are, Wyoming is proud of our wildlife. We're proud of our game and fish management. We're proud of what BLM has done. It, it, we need to continue and do what's best for the wildlife that we, that represent our state. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Two more speakers this evening. Carmel. Carmel Kale. We're all talking about this red desert to hoe back. We're talking about the skinny part, not the looks like a big old bag's corridor to you, but the skinny part. It's world famous and it's famous because it's long. If we break it where those leases are, it won't be long and it won't be very famous. We don't know, and I think that it will not take very much of a small experimental mistake because it is so narrow to potentially sever it or make it non-functional for a herd that's already 50% of what it was, that it wouldn't function for an entire herd. I'm talking about the part of this, the corridor that's by the Prospect Mountains. That's the part that I think needs to be Nobody wants to talk about it, but there are sales February 25th, March 6th, and March 19th. Between them, there are 35 parcels that overlap the corridor. There are some that have been pulled. There would have been more. There would have been 45, but among the three of them, there are 35. 45 were already sold in either September uh, BLM sale or about 13 of them, I think, by the OSLI sales. So if you continue with these sales, there will be 83 sold that overlap the corridor. It doesn't really matter how many deferred. When she looks up and goes down a row of 80 well pads, it's way over. I'd ask you to do anything that you could for that portion by the Prospect Mountains. Thank you. Bruce Lawson, our final speaker of this evening before we wrap up. <clears throat> Thanks for having me tonight. Thanks to all of you for being here and taking the time to uh, have your evening to uh, participate. Um, some of the previous comments are pretty much say it all. I agree that, uh, uh, but let me back up a little bit. I, I'm here to I guess represent myself as a public land owner and represent the Mule Deer of Western Wyoming and also am uh, forwarding some comments from Nick Dobrik with Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Nick couldn't be here tonight, but he did send me an email and had a couple things he would like me to pass along to the Game Fish Commission as well as BLM. Uh, Nick uh, would like uh, recognition of the high use route from Sublet Corridor and other corridors where they exist. Um, he states that the sublet corridor, that's the route uh, that more than 20% of the population that they colored use, and it's the best of the best. Uh, so he's asking that uh, the plan recognize those important corridors very soon. Uh, he indicated that that might be in the process. Secondly, Nick uh, sends a message to the BLM. The BLM needs to move forward with a statewide amendment to all existing RMPs to address migration corridors. And uh, he's asking the Game and Fish uh, request the BLM to do so. Um, uh, my other comments tonight uh, are my own. Uh, and I might add that I'm a Casper, Wyoming native. Uh, my father was a preeminent oil and gas uh, geologist in Casper. He passed away in 2000. 12, but uh, he used to have a bumper sticker on our vehicles as I was growing up in Casper, and it said, Wyoming oil and gas is my bread and butter. And he was right. But uh, the pace of development of oil, oil and gas and other wind in Wyoming right now is very alarming. We know the threats to mule deer uh, from all, all sides, chronic wasting disease, habitat destruction and disruption. And it's time for the oil and gas industry to just slow down a little bit. Uh, what's the hurry? You know, what's the hurry right now? You know, we've, we just learned recently that the state oil and gas commission right now has 25,000 APDs that they're trying to process. So what's the hurry that for, for this continued leasing on these migration corridors, Duane? I, I agree with the previous speaker. It's time not to defer those, it's time to suspend those. And we need, the BLM needs to suspend those leases and those sales until uh, until lease stipulations can be applied to those because 
We've seen what happened to mule deer on the Pinedale Anticline, and we have all these assurances from the BLM and the game of fish and the oil and gas industry that yeah. those mule deer populations on the Anticline were going to be protected. They didn't even honor the triggers that were in place on when those mule deer populations reached a certain decline. So there's no assurance from the BLM or the oil and gas industry that they're going to protect these mule deer corridors until we have some action actual stipulation, lease stipulations applied. So anyhow, that that the end of my comments tonight. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Bruce. Well, we had some great questions and some great comments this evening. And um, just as a reminder, I did get this sheet that I will make sure that I pass along to everybody. If anybody else has any additional comments, written statements, or anything that you would like the panel to have, Please just grab my card off the back table, send me an email, and I'll make sure to get to them. Or if you have something written up and want to hand it to me this evening, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you all for spending your valuable time with us this evening. Um, I hope that you leave this forum with an understanding of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department Migration Corridor Strategy, the process surrounding corridor designation, leasing and development within those corridors, and the role that each different agency plays in the process. It's very complicated, and I know we can get drugged down in a lot of policy. So I appreciate you guys spending the evening with us. And as you guys can see from attendance, I can echo, echo what many people have said tonight. This is a very important topic that people are passionate about, and we thank you guys for, for coming. Um, so Justin, hey, guys, he started off poorly, but he finished on, on, on schedule. We wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of all of these meetings that are coming up. There is a handout in the back that has these listed as well. These are, are coming up to talk about future designations as well. And if you want to join the whole town of Pinedale, which, yeah. which likes to travel around to these meetings, um, you can certainly join them as well and, and be heard out there as well. And on that note, um, thank you guys all for coming and safe travels home. Thank you guys. <laughs>